some of the most important and central concepts in physics are conservation laws. And the great conservation laws of momentum and angular momentum and energy form the basis of an awful lot of what we do as physicists. Uh, in particular, conservation of energy is an especially powerful law, and it's a, uh, it's a principle that's more subtle than the others because there's so many forms of energy and so many ways that energy can transform and transfer within a system. So what I want to do today is to talk about some of the subtleties of work and force and energy as they come up in the context of a specific example. Uh, here's the story. Imagine that it's winter and you're walking across a frozen lake. Very slippery, but you're wearing cleats, so you're fine. In the middle of the lake, you come upon a log. It's two meters long and weighs 24 kilograms, has a mass of 24 kilograms, and it's in your way. So what do you do? You come up and you kick it. And you're in the few moments that your toe is in contact with that log, uh, you exert a constant force of 289 newtons on the log. And in that time that you're exerting a force on the log, all in the plus x direction, uh, the center of mass of the log moves three centimeters in the x direction, but the point P where your foot is touching the log moves seven centimeters. And what that means is that as you, after you kick the log, it goes spinning off across the lake into the distance. Our goal is to figure out what the final center of mass velocity and the final angular velocity around the center of mass of this log are. And we're going to assume, at least at first, that the log is a perfectly rigid object. So it doesn't bend, it doesn't compress, it just is a solid, rigid thing that goes spinning off, and the interaction is given by this data. All right, that's the, that's the setup for all this. The way we're going to approach this, the rest of this video, is something like this. First, I'm going to spend a couple minutes reviewing the concept of the work energy theorem and related concepts that are sometimes subtle and hard to deal with, that actually sometimes even textbook authors mess up or, or brush over the tricky bits a little bit. We're going to do that first. Then we're going to use those tools to solve the problem. And if you want to cut off then and say, ah, that's enough. I've seen how to solve this. That's great. But if there's still a few nagging issues, though, niggling little details that you want to worry about, uh, I'm worried about them too. And I'll spend a few minutes at the end talking about some of those other details, uh, bringing in momentum and angular momentum to really understand fully what's going on with the system. All right. So here's the story. I want to start by talking about the work energy theorem and where it comes from because there are subtleties here. And so in particular, uh, let me remind you of a couple definitions that go into the work energy theorem that go into our thinking about things, uh, calculus definitions. One of them is just the definition of velocity, that velocity of the center of mass of our object is just by definition the derivative dr center of mass dt. That time derivative of position is the definition of velocity. And this, we can do this for a system as a whole and look at the center of mass of it. That's perfectly well defined. Another thing, this is equivalent to Newton's second law, is the definition of force. That the force, I guess technically it's the net force on an object, is equal to the derivative of its center of mass momentum, or total momentum, of the object uh, as uh, uh, with respect to time. That's the definition of force. So we've got those definitions that we're looking at. And finally, I want to talk about energy. And so in particular, the most basic form of energy, the most familiar form, is kinetic energy, energy of motion. And we've got the definition that kinetic energy, and when I say kinetic energy, I always mean kinetic energy of the center of mass of the system, the, the overall net center of mass kinetic energy. Um, kinetic energy of particles moving in relation to that, I'm going to treat as a form of internal energy. Uh, so, uh, kinetic energy, we know, is one-half mv squared. Uh, no relativistic stuff here. We're just talking classical Newtonian physics. So, one-half mv squared, that's kinetic energy. Or, written in terms of momentum, p equals mv, uh, we can write this as one over two m times the momentum squared. Momentum of the center of mass, this is velocity of center of mass. So there's center of mass quantity squared. That is the definition of kinetic energy. Okay, so the whole point of this is I want to talk about the work energy theorem. I want to talk about how forces affect energy, how a force affects the kinetic energy of an object. So what I'm going to do, the simplest thing I know to do to deal with this, is just to take the derivative. What is the time derivative of kinetic energy, dk dt? And I can do that. I'm going to apply that over here. 1 over 2m is a constant. That factors out. 
1 over 2m times, and the derivative of p squared is 2p times dp dt. These are vectors, so I've got some vectory stuff going on. I've got momentum of the center of mass dot product with dp dt. That's fine. And hey, I can use definitions in here. Oh, wait, I, I left out a term. Whoops, whoops. Let me see if I can fit this in. Uh, derivative of p squared is 2p. So there we go. Okay, that's more like it. So, okay, got this. What I want to do is use the definition of momentum, p equals mv, to cancel out there, and the definition of force uh, over here to say that this gives me, this is equal to the velocity of the center of mass dot product with the force. Right? That's equal to velocity because p equals mv divided by m is just v. We're all set. And so in particular, I could say that I can, I can write this as dk dt equals net force dot product with dv center of mass dt. Uh, no, no, dr center of mass. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> This is velocity. Uh, velocity is dr dt, r center of mass dt. That's our dot product. And now, uh, for intuition's sake, I'm going to be a physicist in this. Uh, you can, I promise you can do this the right way by doing an integral and a change of variables. I'm going to be a physicist. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to multiply both sides by dt, which you should never do, but physicists do it all the time. And you can make this rigorous and say, that dk, the change, in a tiny change in the kinetic energy of your object, is equal to f net dot product with dr center of mass. The change in kinetic energy, tiny change in kinetic energy, is equal to the force dot product with a tiny change in position. And again, technically this is all under an integral. Integral of dk equals integral of f dot dr. If this is a constant, if the force is a constant, we go over a finite time, then this would turn into k final minus k initial. That's your change in kinetic energy. And that's going to equal f net. And if the force is constant, then this is just dot product with the change in the center of mass position. And that is, that, so that, that's just, I know I've gone through a bunch of math here. Bear with me. What this is, is showing us that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the force dot product of the change of center of mass position. Now, some people will call this the work energy theorem because force because uh, it's it's a change in energy and it's a force times distance, so it looks like work. Here's a thing that I want you to be very aware of as we do this, though. Work is defined as a slightly different concept. I've reviewed it over here. Work is the, by definition, for a constant force, again, it's an integral if it's not constant, but for a constant force, it's the force dot product with the change in the contact points position. Not delta R center of mass, but delta R point P where the force is acting. That's a significant distinction because one of them moved by three centimeters in our example, and one of them moved by seven centimeters in our example. They're different numbers. This number is not work. It's just force times center of mass distance and it's only related to kinetic energy of the center of mass, the overall kinetic energy of the center of mass of the system. So uh, a lot of authors don't make this distinction. I, I use a textbook by Tom Moore, uh, who's, a, who's thought about these things carefully, and he calls this, I've written it here, the momentum requirement. If you just add k initial to both sides here, k initial plus force dot product with the change in center of mass position equals k final. It's a relationship between kinetic energy of the system overall, of the system center of mass, and force times center of mass displacement. That's the momentum requirement. You can see it comes entirely just from writing kinetic energy in terms of momentum, and this F net equals dp dt is basically conservation of momentum. This is what has to be true for about kinetic energy for conservation of momentum to hold. Work is a slightly different beast. Remember, work is force times the displacement of the point of contact. And here's the hand wavy version of what's going on there. Uh, if you think about the point of contact as being a single particle where your force is acting, whatever single particle you're pushing on, then a single particle only has kinetic energy. It doesn't have other forms of like internal energy to worry about. 
an ideal an idealized single particle, unless you're changing its electron energy state or something. Uh, an idealized single particle does only has kinetic energy to worry about, and so this is the change in the energy of that single particle. And so the work energy theorem says that okay, by doing this force times displacement on a single particle, you have clearly increased its energy by the, its kinetic energy by that much, and that kinetic energy is added to the total energy, that change in kinetic energy is added to the total energy of your entire system. So the system's initial energy plus the energy you added to that one particle equals the system's final energy. And for most systems, of course, that one particle is going to very quickly transfer some of its energy to vibrations inside the system and to motion of other particles in the system because the system's all coupled together. So, uh, but, but in terms of energy accounting, applying the momentum requirement to the one particle that you're touching with your force, then it leads to the work energy theorem that says the total energy plus the work equals the new total energy. And so that, that, that's a slightly different concept. That, so that's why I want to do this to make this separate. What are the other forms of energy, by the way? Uh, in our problem in particular, in this example, we're going to say that the energy of a system is the kinetic energy. We're also going to separate out rotational energy maybe rotational kinetic energy, you might want to call it, the energy of rotation around the center of mass, and add to that all the other forms of internal energy of the system, thermal energy or chemical energy or nuclear energy or whatever. Uh, we're going to have those forms that show up. And kinetic energy, 1 FMV squared, we just said. Rotational energy is 1 half I omega squared if you're rotating around the axis of symmetry of your system. And uh, U other is U other. So, okay, where is this coming from? Uh, where, where does this take us? We're now in a position where we can see how these two different statements about energy are going to come into play. We're going to see that we're going to use both the momentum requirement to figure out how the kinetic energy changes and the work energy theorem that talks about the total energy added to that point of contact and how that enters into the energy of the overall system. And putting that together, we're going to relate it to the total energy of the system. Let's see how that happens in our example. So one crucial thing about our assumption of a rigid object is that bending and stretching and things would store, uh, would store uh, elastic potential energy, like springiness, spring potential energy in the system. Uh, where if you crushed it, you would be breaking chemical bonds, or, or you know, breaking bonds in the system will change its chemical energy. We're not allowing any of those forms to change for a rigid object. So we're going to say the change in other energy is zero. That means in this equation, u other is going to be the same initially and finally. We'll see how that helps us in the end. All right, but to solve this problem, to make progress on it, what I want to do is, well, the momentum requirement seems like a good place to start. It's a straightforward piece here. We're going to just write it down. We know our force. We know our delta RCM. And they're in the same direction. Both are in the plus x direction. So that dot product is just the product of the magnitudes. And so I know that force and there's a, the net force is going to be just this force of our foot kicking it because we're just, you can sort of assume that the upward force holding it up of the lake and the downward force of gravity cancel out. So our force dot product with delta R center of mass is going to be 289 newtons times 3 centimeters is 0 0.03 meters. And if I multiply that out, uh, 289 times uh, 0.03 is 8.67 newton meters, and one newton meter is one joule. And so 8.67 joules of energy have shown up. And I know that that is equal to, that's got to be equal to uh, k final minus k initial. And well, we know this was at rest, the log began at rest. So we know that our k final is going to be 1 half m center mass velocity squared minus 0, because we have no initial kinetic energy because we were sitting still, the log was sitting still to begin with. So 1 half mv squared equals 8.67 newton meters. We can solve this out. We can find that v center of mass squared equals 2 divided by 24 kilograms times 8.67 and joules are kilogram meter squared per second squared and I can cancel kilograms 
and let me uh, let me see what I can come up with here. Uh, Eight point six seven times two divided by twenty four. I get that this is zero point seven two two five meters squared per second squared. So that tells me that my final speed, which is all in the plus x direction, is the square root of this, uh, 0.85 meters per second. I've got that. So that's, that's my calculation using just the momentum requirement. This momentum requirement doesn't involve other forms of energy at all. I figured out my VCM, my final center of mass velocity. Next, I can use the work energy theorem. Next, I can come over and, and say, OK, my total energy is this thing. And I can say E initial plus work equals E final. Um, my E initial, I guess, using taking this over here, I can say that um, E initial is K initial plus U rotational initial plus U other initial plus work equals K final plus U rotational final plus U other final. I've got all that. That's my, that's my work energy theorem applied to my forms of energy here. Uh, the nice thing is, because we weren't moving to begin with, K initial and U rotational initial are zero. There is no initial thing there. Uh, also, because U other doesn't change in this process, assuming that rigid object, a rigid log, uh, we can subtract that from both sides and just cancel it out on the two sides of the equation. And so we wind up with this equation that says our work, which is force dot product with delta r of point P now, the contact point, has to equal 1 half m vcm squared plus 1 half i times omega. Well, I guess I don't need omega cm. Uh, omega is about the center of mass squared. We've assumed that. And that's what we've got. Now, 1 half mv cm squared, I know what that is. That is exactly, um, we, that's this 8.67 joules up here. And 1 half i omega squared. And on this side, force times rp, my, I can do that calculation, 289 newtons times 0 0.07 centimeters gives me 20. 20.23 joules on this side, newtons times meters. Uh, so working with that, I guess I can subtract. I can find out that, let me go up to the top over here, clear some space, and finish this calculation. We've already used all this, talked about it. So, okay, uh, we can finish this. We can say that 1 half I omega squared equals 20.23 minus 8. 0.67, uh, 11.56 uh, joules. And so again, just as we did before for the velocity, we can solve for omega squared. I can find that omega squared is equal to 2 divided by my I, my moment of inertia for a, for a thin rod, I'm assuming it's a thin log, was 1 third mr squared. It'll be a different factor. One third will change if it's not quite uniform or whatever. But uh, if it's not if it's not perfectly thin, one third m r squared. I guess I've assumed it's uniform by assuming the shape of the thing. One third m r squared uh, gives me eight kilogram meters squared times eleven point five six kilogram meters squared per second squared. Uh, when I do that, this is times two divided by eight. I get 2.89, um, let's see, kilogram meter squared cancels top and bottom, one over a second squared. So my angular velocity, my angular speed, I guess, taking the square root of this is 1.7, one over seconds, or the unitless uh, measurement of angle is radians. This is radians per second. So there we have it. That is the end of this story. We have solved our problem. And I want to emphasize here, uh, what I want to emphasize that to solve this problem, we needed both different forms of force related to energy. We needed the work energy theorem 
to talk about the total energy that we that our push added to the system, the 289 newtons times seven centimeters. That total energy change was what came out of this, uh, the 20.23 joules of energy, was how much energy we added to the system. But some of that was, mo was linear motion of the center of mass, and some of it was rotational motion around the center of mass. To separate those out, we used the momentum requirement. And the momentum requirement told us a relationship purely in terms of the kinetic energy and related it to the motion of the center of mass. These are separate concepts, work and the momentum requirement. Work energy and the momentum requirement are separate concepts, and together we can learn more than either one step would tell us separately on its own. That's our story, and uh, maybe I'll use a second video to follow up on this and to, and to talk about some of the subtleties, because this one's already long enough. So I'll, do, I'll talk about the subtleties in a separate video. I hope that for now you can see how we use these principles of the momentum requirement and work energy theorem to solve a problem if you know both of these pieces of information.